hands who made them, and we touch things which are handmade, and those things enrich our heart. How are you, ladies and gentlemen? My name is Miss Amamiya. We have been introducing various kinds of crafts around the world and focusing on the craftsmen and their skills in this program. Today's highlight is decoy making. For today, we have invited a special guest, Mr. Naoki Mukoda, the photographer. Mr. Mukoda, quite often I have seen goose decoys as interior decorating objects, but originally decoys were not ornaments, were they? That's right. Decoys are practical things which are supposed to be used as decoys for goose hunting. Is that so? I've heard that you've collected quite a few number of decoys. Yes, I probably have 100 of them. Oh. And how long have you been collecting them? Let's see, maybe since 30 years ago? Then you must have collected many kinds of them by now. That's true. Well, I'd like to talk to you more about your collection later, but now let's watch the video. There are about 16 million hunters in America. In many areas, the hunting season begins in the fall. Among the hunters, goose hunting is most popular. Using the work decoys, hunters try to attract geese which migrate from the north. American Indians in the U.S. traditionally have been using these work decoys for hunting. This method of hunting has been inherited by the immigrants from Europe. This is the origin of today's wooden decoys. Shapes, materials, methods, and pa paintings of decoy making are all different depending on the area and region. The beauty of simple North American decoys has attracted many collectors to be used as decorating objects as well as hunting tools. Mr. Harry Bichos is one of the well-known decoy craftsmen. He lives in Seasville, which is located about two and a half hours south of New York by car. His typical day starts with gathering the materials. Geese are attracted to this area because there are rivers, lakes, and woods here. Since a long time ago, this area has been popular among hunters. The material used for the decoys made here is Atlantic white cider, which belongs to the spruce family growing in this area. The person who knows the most about Harry's favorite material is Mr. George Bueller at the lumber company. Mr. Bueller and Harry have known each other for over 30 years. <laughs> South Jersey, no stone do with time. And no times back when, when the poor native died, they plant the red cedar and hardware in the land. So I told my family, as I now have told you, this story I heard that I think is true. And I think the poor native sweet trees grow still where the red cedar grows. The part of the spruce lumber used in the thick outer layer surface in decoy making is only about 5 centimeters. This part is light in weight, durable, and hard to crack. These factors are most important for decoys. Harry's experienced eyes can judge the quality of the material. Once he decides which wild bird he is going to model, he outlines the shape of the bird on the board. Most decoys used for hunting are now machine made. The material is used for machine made decoys are either wood, synthetic cork, or plastic. Harry is one of the few decoy craftsmen left in the world. He inherited the technique from his grandfather some 30 years ago. This type of decoy is called Barnegat Bay style, since the method is very unique to the Barnegat region in the southern part of New Jersey. <laughs> The 
One unique aspect of the Barnegat Bay style is that the body part is made from two pieces of wood glued together. This method was developed from the special need of hunters in this region. Usually hunters go together in large groups of people and use several hundred decoys. In the Barnegat area where Harry lives, however, only a few hunters, or occasionally a single hunter, goes hunting in a boat, also called a sneak boat. Therefore, it is essential for the decoys to be light and easy to carry. Compared to other decoys, Harry's decoys are lighter in weight and only about two-thirds the weight of others. Harry's are small in size, light in weight, and smooth on the surface, which is essential for hunting in this area. When the body is finished, he starts making the head. Once he cuts out a rough shape by using a copying saw, he doesn't spend much time making the head. He makes heads with various kinds of expressions by carving with a knife. These heads reflect what he observes in real geese in the nature. He also has many other types of wooden birds here and there in his yard. They don't look as if they are just taking a rest on the branches. These birds also reflect the expression which Harry observes when, he, when they visit his yard. Some people think a clam digger he got a mighty fine Riding along in his old world In the good old summer time It's a beautiful day On morning at bay
デコイズスムの合間に移し取ったものです。These are the collections of the shows from three generations of decoy making. In addition to the Barnegat decoys they made, there are approximately 300 decoys collected here by Harry's father, Mr. Harry Mitchell Shrouds, and his grandfather, Mr. Harry Vincentson Shrouds I. He is one of the greatest contributors who made the Barnegat decoy known all around the world, and he is also known as the greatest decoy maker. These are the masterpieces of the three generations of the Shows. From the left, the grandfather's, father's, and Harry's work. Decoys used to be all different from each other. We used to make decoys by going out for hunting ourselves and observing the real birds in nature. I believe that decoy making shouldn't be just making something similar to real geese, but it also has your dream. It shouldn't be just making a duplicate exactly the same as a real bird. That is, a, that is the spirit of decoy making. Harry lost his father when he was only 12 years old, but he learned the decoy making techniques on his own while recalling the scenes of his father working. Just as his grandfather had been making decoys as a hobby while making a living as a house painter, Harry is also making decoys as his hobby. But since he is around 30 years old, people started to pay attention to his decoys. When the shape of the decoy is done, he makes a small ditch in the bottom breast to be filled with a lead weight. Which makes it float on the water stability. There is nothing to be wasted in the shop. The scrap wood is used for heating during the winter and to melt lead weights. My decoys are basically used for hunting, so they have to be light and have a weight to keep balance in the water. So they are hollow, hollow inside. I believe craft is not just for decoration only. His sharp eyes as a great craftsman and his polished skill produce masterworks. Now he drills holes in the head part and inserts eyes. Eyes are very important for decoys. When the shape is completed, he now applies a rough coating on it. The finished decoys all have different expressions. My grandfather's decoys look somehow solemn compared to my father's. On the other hand, my father's look elegant and cute. Mine are probably somewhere in between them. The next day, when the coating is dry, he starts the coloring. For durability, oil-based paint is necessary, but acrylic paints are also used for the parts which require more delicate expressions. He proceeds to this final coating without preliminary drawing.
The work is dependent upon his skilled workmanship and delicate color combination. The decoy does not mean a fake goose, but it means something more than a real bird. Harry's decoys look somehow smiling. This is the most important characteristic of his decoys. I think I am a happy person. This is probably why people say my decoys are smiling. You see, my decoys reflect my feelings. Harry used to go hunting himself, but now he spends his leisure time floating his decoys in the water and observing them. It is really exciting when I get special orders to make something different. Thinking of the shape, design, and plan how to start is a real fun process. In 1989, he was honored as National Heritage Hero, which is probably equivalent to the living national treasure in Japan. So I can see that he tucks his dreams in his decoys. I'm impressed that there are so many kinds of decoys, and that decoy maker's observations reflect in the appearance of the decoy. How did you like watching this video, Mr. Mukuda? Well, I agree that decoy making is not simply to make a look alike, but to express the maker's emotion in it. Today, Mr. Mukoda has brought some of his collections to the TV studio. Is this the one which was actually used for hunting by American Indians? I can see that the body part is made from two pieces. That's right. The inside is hollow and weighs and weight inside. I can hear the sound of it. How old do you think it is? I'll guess it's about 100 years old. It's very pretty, isn't it? How about this one? This one's quite heavy. I believe it was made by a hunter for his own use. You see, goose hunting is usually done at dawn, so it really doesn't matter how it really looks. As long as it can get attract geese, it serves its purpose. It doesn't have to be a precise replica. You mean as long as it has the shape of a goose? Right. I see. And as long as it can float in the water in good stability, how about this one? It's a little light, isn't it? I found this one in Mazacura Island in Spain. It's made of a driftwood. Doesn't it have beauty, beauty in its simplicity? No wonder. It is very light. The shape is also very beautiful. Now I really believe that decoys were not only ornaments, but were practical tools. That's correct. Being a designer yourself, what do you feel most attractive in decoys? You see, there are many kinds of families among geese, and people in one particular region needed one 
which would be used for hunting a particular kind of goose which inhabited there or flew over there. So theoretically, there are the same number of kinds of decoys as the number of kinds of geese. That means there are many kinds of decoys. Exactly. Besides, as you know, the shapes are also different between males and females. The male is prettier than the female. And the shapes and sizes are also different between the male and the female. The female is smaller. What was your first feeling when you saw for your, a decoy for the first time? Well, I was young. I too went hunting myself, and a long time ago I went to Europe to study. Then I saw a decoy in an antique store in Europe. I fell in love with it, and of course I wanted to buy it. But you see, it was not cheap, so I couldn't afford it. I had to wait a little while until I could have enough money to buy one. Even now I hear about people in noble families collecting them in Europe. Yes, I have seen those as interior decorating ornaments in castles in Europe. Besides, they are also different depending on which country or region I have brought it from. Each has its own expression. In which country or in which area have you found the most interesting decoys? I love the one which I showed you a little while ago. The one American Indian used for real hunting. I wish I could talk more about decoys, but unfortunately, we must stop now. Thank you very much. うん。そうですね。だからやっぱり。そうですね。だからやっぱり。そうですね。だからやっぱり。そうですね。だからやっぱり。そうですね。だからやっぱり。そうですね。だからやっぱり。そうですね。だからやっぱり。そうですね。だ